الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. الحمد لله. I want to welcome everybody to um, our next discussion on the ideal Muslim and ideal Muslima. Uh, today, inshallah ta'ala, as we go back and forth between the ideal Muslim, uh, the ideal Muslima, uh, today we will be covering the ideal Muslima. What most brothers are looking for, um, what most brothers are looking for in a Muslim woman. And today's discussion will be about beauty. All right. Today's discussion is going to be about beauty. And for those of you women who are listening, um, I would suggest that you bring your daughters or if you have opportunity after the class is over with to listen to this again with your daughters. If you have young teenage daughters, very important, man, very important that they have a clear understanding from an Islamic perspective of what beauty is and what beauty isn't. All right. A lot of, uh, a lot of you women, unfortunately, a lot of you sisters are misleading your daughters. You are misleading your daughters as it relates to what beauty really is. And so they're walking around with this superficial understanding of what beauty is. And as a result, you know, they end up in some very, you know, they end up getting some very hard lessons, you know, some very harsh lessons in life. Because what we don't teach our children, life will. Facts. What you don't teach your children, life will teach them. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we give them, we give them reality. We give them reality and stop feeding them. You know what I mean? It's like stop feeding your children this superficial reality. Stop feeding your children this superficial reality because that's the world that you live in. And learn how to deal with life on life's terms. All right, so... Some of you are not going to like me after this, you know, discussion is over with. But, you know, it's okay. Time heals all wounds. <laughs> so, uh, you know, in time, inshallah, you, you you know. But, you know, I'm not driven by, you know, pleasing people. I'm driven by, you know, pleasing my Lord and, and saying what needs to be said. I mean, like, I sat back this whole summer and just, you know, flipping through Instagram and just watching Muslim women on Instagram. And it's, it's really disgusting, man. A lot of you sisters should be ashamed of yourselves, man. And, you know, that this is what Islam has been reduced to in America. This is Islam in America. If somebody came here from another country and just took a flip through Instagram and saw, you know, the way that Muslims represent Islam. And, and it, would be, it would be different if you got on Instagram not as a Muslim. As this, that's just who you are. You ratchet. That's that's just who you are as an individual. But we get on Islam. Uh, I mean, we get on Instagram and we represent in Islam like like that's really Islam. And like, and I'm sitting here scratching my head. Like, you got to be kidding me, man. This is Islam. This is Islam. This is the Islam that your parents gave you? This is the Islam that, you know, that you got out of the Quran and the Sunnah? Or this is just your version of Islam? Your, you know, experience with Islam at this very moment and you sharing that with the world? If you struggling with Islam, brothers and sisters, let me just say this to you right now. If you are struggling with Islam right now, you struggling with religion, you struggling with God, right? That's, that's your struggle, the world doesn't need to be introduced to your struggle because the world is going to interpret that as Islam. And it's not Islam. And I, I'm i going to be the one. I'm going to be the one to say that is not Islam. And you're not going to like me. And that doesn't make me perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not putting myself up like, you know, I'm the perfect specimen of a Muslim. I'm not. But my issues are not in public. Whatever I'm struggling with, with Islam, that's between me and my Lord. That's my struggle and my, and that's between me and my Lord. I'm not introducing the world, right, to my struggle with Islam. You had a bunch of sisters, man. I ain't going to say where they from, but if you, you on Instagram, you know what it is. You had a bunch of sisters who did a music video. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, like, it's, it's, it's really, it's really sad, man. 
bunch of Muslim sisters with hijab on, tight jeans on, parts of your jeans cut out. You know, you riding around in a car and, you know, doing donuts in the car with the music playing in the back. And you post this, you post this crap on Instagram like it's cool. I mean, you think nobody going to call you on it. You think nobody going to say nothing about it. Nah, I'm going to call you out. I'm going to, I'm going to call you out. I mean, I have to. I, I have to. I don't have no other choice, man, because you're forcing people's hands to accept this as the new version of Islam. And I, I, I promise you, as long as I am alive, as long as I have a voice, as long as I have the ability to speak truth to power, you got, I'm, I'm going to be your problem. I am going to be your problem. Right, I'm your thorn in your side. You know what I mean? Like it who like it, don't like it who don't like it. But I'm going to call that stuff out because it's not Islam, man. It's not Islam. Now, if you just did that as a, you know, you just so happen to be Muslim, but you out doing your thing, all right, that's one thing. But you, when you're doing that under the guise that this is Islam, you're crazy. You're crazy to think that I'm going to sit back and I'm not going to say nothing about it. I'm going to call you out straight up. If you post something on Instagram, if that joint come across my table and it's ratchet and it's a misrepresentation of Islam, I am going to call you out on it. Facts. All day long. I'm the thorn in your side, man. And stop liking this stuff, man. Stop liking this stuff. So let me let me let me get into the let me get into the meat and potatoes of this, man. Most men, most men, if not all, are looking for a woman who is beautiful. Okay. Now, here we go. With the exception to the rule. Because you have some brothers. No, they not, brother Imam. Some brothers just want a sister who fear Allah. Some brothers just want a sister who good and practicing they deen. Okay. Whatever. You are an exception to the rule. Not the rule. Okay. You are an exception to the rule. Not the rule. Most men. Most men are looking for a woman who is beautiful. And those are the men that I'm speaking to right now. <laughs> I'm not I'm not talking about the dudes who just want to marry for Dean. You don't care what she look like and all that other nonsense, man. That's nonsense that you just want to marry a good Muslim sister. You don't really care about looks. Who don't care about looks? The messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, cared about looks. Facts. You think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just married women just on the strength that they were good practicing Muslim women or did he have a preference? <laughs> did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have a preference? Absolutely he had a preference. I I'm going to show you. So miss me with all of this pseudo-religious jargon. I don't care what the sister looks like. I just want to marry a good Muslim sister. Man, miss me with all of that, man. You got to be kidding me. That doesn't make you more religious because you don't care what the because you don't care what the sister look like. That doesn't make you more religious. That doesn't make you more pious or God conscious. And it's deceptive because you do actually care what the woman looks like. It's just that you needed to satisfy a desire and you would have said anything you needed to say at that moment to get what you wanted. And then just after you married a woman, then you're going after a second wife. You engage in an infidelity because now you're going after what you really want. Because you realize that that ideology, that belief was a farce. It wasn't real. It was some pseudo-religiosity that was handed to you by another nut that said, oh, you don't really care about what the sister looked like. You just got to marry your pious sister. You got to be kidding me. And then after you marry her, then you out looking for a second wife, which is really your pursuit of what you want. You understand? Can't imagine how many sisters are stuck in marriages with brothers right now who really, really are not attracted to them. And they're pursuing what they really want using polygyny, using polygyny, using infidelity. You understand? Going after what you really want. When in fact, you should have just married who you wanted from the door and left alone the pseudo-religiosity of, I don't care what she looked like, I just want a righteous sister. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? I want a righteous sister. I don't really care. I'm not, I'm not into looks. I don't care. Who says they're not into looks? <laughs> I'm really just trying to figure this out, man. I, because I've heard this. I heard this myself. I'm not speaking to you from a 
you know, abstract theoretical perspective. I am speaking to you directly from the mouths of certain brothers in these circles who talk about they don't care what the sister look. I don't care about looks. Okay, right. And meanwhile, your, your first wife can feel the fact that you're not attracted to her, but you don't care about looks. All right. So most men, most men um, are looking for a woman who is beautiful. All right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, follow me, follow me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Muslim men to choose a woman who meets their personal preferences with respect to the intangible qualities such as good character, morals, integrity, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah number four, surah number four, ayat three, follow me. I'm not giving you, yani, I'm not giving you this from myself. I'm telling you what Allah said in his book. Allah commanded the Muslim men to go after women who meet their personal preferences, which are based or rooted in the intangible qualities of good character, morals, integrity, not the physical qualities, even though physical qualities could be included in that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَنْكِحُوا مَا قَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَثُلَاثَ وَرُبَعَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, marry the women of your preference. Fankihu ma yani alladhi tabalakum. Marry the women who meet your preferences. Mathna wa thulatha wa ruba, two, three, or four, and if you fear that, you know, to the end of the ayah. So on number four, ayat three. So this ayah is pointing to the fact that what a man should be in pursuit of is more about the qualities of character rather than the physical qualities, although physical qualities are included in that. Surah number four, ayah three. Surah to Nisa. Marry the women of your preference. Two, three, or four. All right. So Islam actually encourages men to go after beauty, to go after the woman that meets your preferences, whether it is physical beauty or the beauty of character and morals and integrity. You guys follow me? All right. However, I think we get confused about what true beauty is and what it isn't. We get confused about what true beauty is and what true beauty isn't. And this is mostly due to the dictates of the society that we live in, right? That has given us standards of beauty that are unrealistic, number one, and that are conflicting with the divine interpretation of beauty. You understand? So we get conflicted. We get conflicted about what real beauty is based upon what society has already now dictated to us. Society tells us what beauty is. Society has told us what beauty is and what the standards of beauty are. However, those standards that society has given us conflicts with the reality of what real beauty is and it conflicts with what our religion tells us what beauty is. All right? This is especially true, um, you know, with brothers who, you know, adopt these superficial, you know, uh, notions or understanding of what beauty is. The Prophet Sallallahu he alluded to the superficiality of what men saw in women prior to Islam. He mentioned in a hadith some of the reasons that women were married for before Islam. He said, Tunkahu al Mara li Arba'in that a woman was married for four reasons. Women were usually married for four reasons prior to Islam. Prior to Islam, women were usually married for four reasons. This hadith is not an encouragement to marry women for four reasons. This hadith is ikhbar. This is the Prophet Sallallahu informing us of pre-Islamic Arab culture and what women were usually married for. 
understand the cultural context of the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. Words have context. That's what give words meaning. If you don't understand the context of the words, then you're not going to understand the meaning. Understand. Brothers and sisters, stop reading these hadith and off you go thinking that you understand Islam. You don't. There's a context there. The Prophet ﷺ is not telling us to marry women for one of these four reasons. He is giving us information about the reasons women were married for prior to Islam. And then the standard that Islam came to add to that. It doesn't subtract, it doesn't dismiss that. Islam just adds to that. You follow me? So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Tunkahu al maratu al mar'a li arba." That a woman was married for four reasons. Limaliha, she was married for her wealth. Very important. You know, uh, European culture, they still do that. They marry for money. A woman was married, you know, she's the duchess, or she's the princess, or she's this, or she's that. Men will usually pursue her, you know, for her, her riches. You know, she was an orphan and family left behind money for her. Women were usually will be married for those reasons, for, for the money. All right? Limaliha, for her wealth. Wali jamaliha, and for her beauty. Showing you that prior to Islam, women were married for their beauty. He said, wali hasabiha. And she was married for her family status. She comes from, you know, good stock. Come from a good flock. Come from, you know, the upper echelons of, you know, their, their social, social class. Right? Women were married for that. What is her last name? Her family name. And she was married for that. He said, And uh, the woman is married for her religion. Some women were married for religion. He said, Choose the woman who has the deen. That does not mean do not choose a woman who comes from a good family. That does not mean don't choose a woman who is not beautiful. That does not mean don't choose a woman uh, you know, who is beautiful or don't choose a woman who has money. That means do not single those three things out. Without factoring in deen, without factoring in religion. So if you marry a woman, make sure she has deen. Uh, if you marry a woman who has money, make sure she has deen. If you marry a woman who has beauty, make sure she has deen. If you marry a woman who comes from a good stock, come from a good family, make sure she has deen. Because if you marry a woman for those things and religion is not a part of that, she is going to oppress you with those things. If you marry a woman who has money and she has no religion, she's going to use her money to oppress you. If you marry a woman with, who is beautiful and she does not have deen, she's going to oppress you with her beauty. If you marry a woman who comes from a good family and she does not have religion, she does not have deen, she does not have a level of God consciousness, she is going to oppress you. You understand? He said, Choose the woman who has religion. That does not mean dismiss all of the other things. That means choose a woman who has those things because those things are normal, but add deen to that. Factor in religion with that. Okay? Thus, Islam came to put everything in perspective um, placing religion, placing deen as a top priority on the list of qualities that a man should look for in a woman when he is considering her for marriage. You got it. Islam does not say you cannot look for those things, but Islam is saying factor in religion. Because if the woman is religious and she's beautiful, then that religion is going to help her balance out her beauty. If that woman has wealth, she has money, and she's religious, her deen is going to help her balance that out. If the woman comes from a good family, the upper echelons of society, right? And she has deen, deen is going to help her level that out. She's not going to use it to oppress you or to pull you away from Islam because she has Islam. You guys following me? Understand the context of the hadith. 
So Islam did not come to erase or eradicate or remove these things, but to put deen, put religion as the top priority on the list of qualities that a man should be looking for in a woman when he is considering her for marriage. So it doesn't dismiss the physical beauty as even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a preference. Did you know that? Did you know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a preference in you know, the type of woman that he wanted? For all of you brothers who say, I don't care what she looked like, I just want a religious sister. That is an imbalance. That is an imbalance. That is a gross imbalance. That is a gross imbalance that Islam does not confirm that. So all you young brothers out there talking about, I don't care. Like, stop listening to these brothers, man. Stop listening to brothers. It's almost like jail lawyers. Like, you go to jail and everybody got it all figured out. Well, meanwhile, y'all all in jail. Y'all all got the freaking answers, but everybody locked up. Y'all all got it all figured out. Meanwhile, you sitting behind bars. Same thing with, you know, Muslim men. You got it all figured out. But your marriages are in shamble. Or you single. How you single trying to give somebody advice, you know what I mean, about marriage? You single. Stay in the singles lane, man. Talk to, you know, talk about what it means to be single. Don't talk about what it means to be married because you're not married. For whatever reason, you're not married. Stop trying to give brothers advice. I mean, these younger brothers, man, getting, you know, bad advice, poor advice from brothers who are either in failing relationships or just got out of a failed relationship. How are you trying to give somebody advice, man? Anyway, the Prophet Sallallahu he had a preference and beauty was one of them. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Hubbiba ilayya min dunyakum thalatha. Three things that I love from your dunya. Three things, the Prophet Sallallahu said, three things that I love from your dunya, from your world. Atib, good smell, good fragrance. Wan nisa, and women. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, I love women. And the pleasure of my eye is in prayer. Right? The pleasure of my eye is in prayer. So the Prophet Wasallam, one of the three things that he loved from this world was women. This was a man. This is being realistic. This is being realistic. It's nothing wrong with, you know, you know, having a preference in terms of what you look for in a woman. Nothing wrong with that. This is why when Aisha saw Juwadia, right? Listen to this conversation that Aisha had. Before the Prophet ﷺ married Juwadia, right? If you go back and you read the story of Juwadia, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, married a woman by the name of Juwadia. But before he married her, Aisha saw Juwadia, right? Aisha saw Juwadia. Listen to what she said. She said, For wallahi, ma an ra'aytuha ala bab hijrati, hijrati, fa karihtuha, wa araftu annahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sayyara minha ma ra'aytu. Aisha said, When Juwadia came to my door, she said, Lo and behold, this woman came to my door. Because Juwadi was asking the Prophet Sallallahu permission or asking the Prophet Sallallahu to purchase her freedom, right? She was captured. Her, her tribe was, you know, slaughtered or they were killed. They went into battle with the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi in the battle of Muraysiya. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu captured, you know, her people, whatever the case may be. And she, you know, was a, you know, she was of a higher social class. And she couldn't fathom herself being a slave to anybody. So she went to the Prophet Sallallahu and asked him to purchase her freedom. And Aisha said, lo and behold, this woman came to my door. He said, when I, she said, when I looked, ma an ra'aytuha ala bab hujrati. He said, she said, when I looked out of my door, I saw the woman standing at my door. She said, fakarihtuha. And I hated her. <laughs> the moment I saw her, I hated her. Why? Because she was beautiful. Aisha said, the moment I saw her, I hated her. She said, and I knew that the messenger of Allah وسلم, was going to see in her what I saw in her. And he was going to marry her. Don't tell me the Prophet وسلم, didn't have 
uh, a preference. Aisha said, I knew when I saw her that the prophet was going to see what I saw and he was going to want to marry her. Meaning her beauty. She was beautiful. Aisha said, the moment I saw her, I hated her. <laughs> I hated her. Right? S some of you women probably have experienced this. If you have a handsome husband, you out in public, you see a pretty sister, maybe look like you, maybe look better than you. And you see her and you like, dag, man, I, I hear this woman coming over here, you know, coming over here close to me and my husband. Because you know your husband has a preference. You've been with your husband long enough, you know that he has a preference. Might be you, might not be you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you know that he has a preference. Aisha said, the moment I saw her, I hated her. I hated her. She said, and I knew that the Prophet ﷺ was going to see from her what I saw from her. And he was going to marry her. So this whole idea of I don't care what the woman looks like is a farce. It's not real, man. And it doesn't make you more religious. Brother, stop doing this. Because you're marrying sisters. You're marrying sisters... And they are not your preference. They're not what you're looking for in a woman. And you marry them anyway. You marry them anyway. And then you, you know, time passes and then you start to come to grips with yourself. You start to become real with yourself. And you start to realize that the woman that I married is not, if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have married somebody like her. She's not my type. Well, the thing is, is that you had an opportunity not to marry her at the at the beginning of your marriage. You could have pulled out of the situation, but for some reason, you kept telling yourself, looks are not important. I don't care what she looked like. And yes, you do oppress them because you begin to resent them. You begin to resent them because they are not what you wanted in a woman. And then you begin to, cre you know, commit infidelities, you know, your indiscretions. And then you begin to cheat under the guise of looking for a second wife. Every time you turn around, you're looking for a second wife. And the fact of the matter is that you're not looking for a second wife. You're looking for a first wife. You're looking for a first wife. And you had the opportunity to do that from the very beginning. But you totally dismissed that. All right, so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said on the authority of, let me, I'm, I'm just trying to lay a premise here. All right, I'm trying to lay a premise here and then I'm going to segue into what I need to talk about. But I wanted to get this out of the way, you know, to establish that in Islam, we are entitled as men to have a preference. You are entitled to have a preference and you are entitled to go after what your preference is. Nothing wrong with that. But what you are not allowed to do is to dismiss your preference under the guise of being religious, under the guise of being God conscious and God fearing and functioning on higher frequencies of God consciousness. So much so that you don't see, you know, you don't see beauty and you'll marry a sister and then only to realize later on that you actually do have a preference. You actually do have a preference. You actually do have a preference. And it's wrong on every level to marry for a man, to marry a woman, knowing he is not physically attracted to her. It is wrong on every level for a man to marry a woman he is not physically attracted to simply because he just needs to get married at this very moment and then he'll work out the details later. It's wrong on every level. It is wrong on every level. You're going to marry a woman knowing that she is not your preference. Knowing she's not your preference from the very beginning. But you marry her anyway because I need to, you know, it's, you know, you know, the urgency of getting married. I need to fear a law. I need to not subject myself to fornication or adultery. And so you marry the woman only to realize months later, years later. Years later, that I actually do have a preference and this woman that I'm married to is not my preference. And if I had to do it all over again, I wouldn't have married her. And meanwhile, you got kids with her. Meanwhile, you done wasted, you know, years of this woman's life. It's like, like, I mean, how selfish is that? Selfish. 
It's wrong on every level. All right. The Prophet Sallallahu said to one of his companions by the name of Jabir ibn Abdullah. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala an. He said, إِذَا خَطَبَ أَحَدُكُمْ الْمَرْأَةَ فَإِنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَى مَا يَدْعُوهُ إِلَى نِكَاحِهَا فَلْيَفْعَلْ For you young brothers, I want you to listen closely. I want you to listen closely. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if one of you proposes to a woman for marriage, one of you proposes to a woman for marriage, he said, فَإِنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ أَنْ يَنْظُرْ and he has the ability to go look at what will encourage him to follow through with the marriage. Then let him do so. Meaning go look at the woman. Go look at her. If any one of you proposes to a woman. Because during that time, a man might be having a conversation with another man. And the man might say, hey, listen, I have a daughter. You want, you want to marry my daughter? And the man would just... Accept that proposal because the person comes from a, you know, more elite, you know, family in that society, higher upper echelons of society. So it wasn't really questioned. It wasn't really questioned. It was like, yeah, I have a daughter. You want to marry my daughter? Yeah, I'll marry your daughter. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that if any one of you proposes to a woman, right, and you have the ability to go look at her first before you marry her, Go take a look at her. Don't just marry a woman because this was, here again, the cultural context. This was something that was, you know, in pre-Islamic times. The pre-Islamic Arab culture. You understand? And some brothers still do that today. I mean, like there was a time in the Islamic community when I first took Shahada. There was a time in the Islamic community where you could have a sit down, three, four, five sit downs with a sister. And she has on niqab. You never even seen what she looked like. And here you are having a full out conversation about how you're going to spend your lives together. Facts all day long. You're having two, three sit downs with a sister who has on full face veil. You don't even know what she looked like. And yet you're still having conversations about, you know, getting married and what married life is going to be like and what 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 is she looking for in a spouse? What you looking for in a spouse? Meanwhile, the ultimate, the elephant in the room, which is what in the world does she look like, has never even been discussed. Has never. I mean, this is facts all day long. I'm, I kid you not. I took my Shahada in 1997. I began frequenting Muslim communities by the year 1999-2000. And this was facts. This was rampant in the Muslim communities. More so the Salafi communities. Or the, the heavy on the Sunnah communities, right? During that time, it wasn't Salafiya. It was you on the Sunnah. All day long. You having two, three sit-downs with a sister. You don't even know what she looked like. So we're not even talking about pre-Islamic Arab culture. We're talking about pre-Islamic culture that has been infused into modern day African-American Salafi Muslim communities. Facts all day long. So you have brothers who have sisters, you know, sit downs with sisters and don't even know what they look like. Well, if you've never had that experience, then consider yourself blessed and highly favored. I'm sorry. I've had that experience, and I know tons of brothers who have had that experience as well. This is not an anomaly. This is not something that is bizarre. This is something that is ubiquitous. Absolutely. Maybe not today. Maybe not today. But 20 years ago in the Muslim community, in the hardcore Sunni communities, yes. Yes. Very, very common. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that if any one of you has the ability to see from the woman what will inspire you, what will encourage you to marry her, then let him do so. Then let him do so. Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, فَخَطَبْتُ Jariya. Jabir, he said, taking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's advice, he said, I proposed to a woman. I proposed to a woman. He said, وَتَخَبَّتُ يَتَخَبَّأُ لَهَا حَتَّى رَأَيْتُ مِنْهَا مَا دَعَانِ إِلَى نِكَاحِهَا وَتَزَوَّجْتُهَا So Jabir ibn Abdullah, he said, So I hid behind a bush. I proposed to a woman. And then I went and hid behind a bush so that I could see from the woman what would inspire me to marry her. 
It doesn't necessarily mean just her face, but could also mean, you know, the shape of her body as she's walking, maybe the garment, you know, you know, if you stare in hard enough, then obviously you could see, you know, whether or not she's slim, whether she's thick, whether she's, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever your preference is. All right. So beauty, physical beauty has its place in Islam. Brother, stop saying, I don't care what the sister look like. I just want a pious, righteous sister. You're going to end up oppressing her because once the dust settles, once those drugs wear off after the honeymoon phase and you start to see her for who she is, you are going to be displeased and you are going to resent her and you're going to oppress her. You have an opportunity to marry what your preferences are. And beauty is definitely a preference for most men. All right. So beauty, physical beauty has its place. This um, speaks to the point of brothers who dismiss beauty under the guise of Dean and marry a woman uh, who is not their type and end up overcompensating for this uh, mistake that they made through polygyny or infidelity for that matter. You're trying to overcompensate for the fact that you didn't marry a man, right? You didn't marry, you didn't marry a woman who is, you know, your, your preference. So you overcompensating for that through polygyny and through uh, infidelity. Islam places great emphasis on being organically authentic in both physical appearance as well as in character. So I'm off of that. Now we're segueing into the meat and potatoes of my discussion. Sisters, I want you guys to pay attention. Islam places great emphasis on being organically authentic, not just authentic, but organically authentic, both in physical appearance, both in physical appearance, as well as in character. And this explains why most, if not all of the modern standards of beauty are haram and beyond the parameters of what is divinely allowed. Weaves, wigs, lashes, fake eyelashes, additions to your body, subtractions from your body, all to enhance the beauty of your body, conflict and totally contradict the divine encouragement to be organic, be organic and is aligned with shaitan's plot to prove that we are undeserving and ungrateful for the blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has bestowed upon us. The Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in surah number 4, ayat 119. Pay attention. Surah number 4, ayat 119. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, speaking on, speaking on behalf of shaitan, this is shaitan saying this. Allah is revealing it to us. Shaitan says, I will lead them astray. Meaning the children of Adam. I will lead the descendants of Adam. I will lead them astray. And I will create in them false desires. I will create in them false desires, desires that are predicated, premised on things that are not real. False desires. And I will command them to slip the ears of cattle, meaning change, you know, to, to change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's you know, animals, the animals, and look at what the scientists are doing now by mixing DNAs, mixing, you know, all types of, you know, splitting, you know, these things and changing this. They're now, you know what I mean, a lot of the, um, a lot of the salmon is not even organic, real salmon. They've created another animal by mixing a salmon with another creature to make the salmon, to reproduce with the salmon, to make the salmon bigger. So all you salmon eaters out there, be aware, be cautious. Don't think because you eating salmon like you you live in the high life. You might not you might not even be eating what is a salmon. You might be eating a completely different animal. Understand that. It's not even salmon. They've now, you know, breeded salmon with another animal. Because when they breed the salmon, you know, although the larger part of it might be salmon or it looks like salmon, right? Splitting the genes. Yes, thank you. Facts all day long, man. This is what they're doing to animals. They're mating animals. This animal and this animal, let's mate them and see what type of animal it produces. 
This is what Shaitan promised in the Quran 1430 something years ago. He said, I will command them to slit the ears of cattle. And I will command them to change the creation of Allah. So you women, by accepting these modern standards of beauty, this is what you are doing. You are changing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation for beauty. Now, if you're getting, you know, procedures done, you know, for health reasons, you know, maybe you're obese, maybe you're overweight and you have to get this surgery done or that surgery done, or, you know, some surgery was had done to your reconstructive surgery to your stomach. Maybe you had a child, maybe you had a C-section to get reconstructive surgery. There's nothing wrong with that because that is not about beauty. Your body was not like that. You understand? So reconstructive surgery is to bring the body back to the way that it was prior to whatever incident changed it. Teeth whitening, that's not thats not changing the creation. You guys got to stay with me. If I'm speaking to the wrong crowd, then let me know. <laughs> let me know. <laughs> You guys got to stay with me. I'm, I'm, I'm only speaking to you because I, I believe that you guys are intelligent. And I'm not going to go into the intricacies of what I'm saying. Like, you guys get it. You get it. Don't force my hand. Like, don't do it. The weaves, the adding hair to your hair, right? The wigs, the weave. First of all, that stuff stinks, number one. It makes your scalp stink, your hair stink. Everything about you, you start to smell like the weave and smell like the wig. It stinks. And God forbid it's a, it's a cheap wig or cheap weave and people can see that you got on a weave. I mean, I thought that the whole purpose of putting it in was to make it look like your real hair. We putting on, we putting on, you putting on weaves and wigs and people can spot your wig from a mile away. It's like, I mean, like it's nothing cute about it. Not to mention it goes against the standards of beauty in Islam. You've accepted these standards. Right? He said, I will command them and they will change the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the weaves, the wigs, the fake eyelashes, the getting the eyebrows arched. And in some instances, cutting the eyebrow completely off so you can line it yourself with a liner. So there's nothing beautiful about that. There, these are European standards of beauty that conflict with the reality of what real beauty is and conflicts with what divine, you know, uh, standards of beauty are. The superficiality, pay attention, brothers and sisters. The superficiality of your of one's outlook. Makeup is not haram. Makeup is not haram. Makeup is not haram. Obviously, everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. But adding hair to your hair, the Prophet ﷺ cursed the woman who added hair to her hair. Now, for some of you who say, well, what about putting yarn in your hair? First of all, you you look silly with yarn in your hair. Let me let me just say that. That 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 whole idea just to try to circumvent putting fake hair so you're going to opt for yarn. So you, you're a grown woman, a whole grown woman walking around with yarn in your hair, trying to circumvent what is already haram and putting the yarn in your hair is haram too. Why? Because it's the same concept. You're trying to make your hair look fuller and thicker than what it really is. It's not about the weave. It's about adding anything to your hair to make it look longer, fuller, healthier than what it really is. Goes against the Islamic standards of being organically authentic. Organically authentic. So don't say, well, what about putting yarn in your hair? Yarn is haram as well. It's haram. Adding anything to your hair that makes your hair look other than what it really is, is haram. I don't care what it is. Yarn, toilet tissue, I wouldn't give a dag on what it is. It's haram.
the the scholars of usul al fiqh they have a principle a maxim a principle islamic principle rule it says al hukum yatba'u al illah that the islamic ruling follows the reason so as long as the reason is there the ruling still applies so if weave is haram and why is weave haram because the reasoning behind it which is to make the hair look fuller thicker you know more healthy look more than what it really is does that same reason apply if you put yarn in your hair yes because that's the whole purpose of putting it in there Al-hukum yatba'u al-illa. The Islamic ruling follows the, uh, the Islamic ruling follows the reason. So as long as the reason is there, the ruling still applies. So don't say, oh, well, if I put this in my hair of that, no. Don't put nothing in your hair. If your hair is short, then wear your hair short. Stand in your discomfort. Nothing wrong with that. Tons of brothers out here who adore women with short hair. Nothing wrong with that. It's a maxim, not an axiom. Axiom is something totally different. Islamic rulings, principles. All right? So the superficiality, pay attention, the superficiality of one's outlook on beauty begins to affect the genuineness of your character. The superficiality, well, I can't speak for other cultures. I'm speaking for my culture. Our women have to learn how to be comfortable in their own skin. Skin bleaching, skin whitening, absolutely all of that. Putting the makeup on to make your skin look lighter than what it really, really is. Different than putting, you know, makeup on, blotching this and that or whatever the case. Just because you like the way that your face looks with makeup on. That's one thing. But putting makeup on to make your skin look lighter because you are dis dissatisfied with the color that the hue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, la wallahi. Islam is an organic religion, man. Organic religion. Teaches us to stand in our discomfort and be comfortable with who and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us. Our men have to be comfortable with organically authentic. You're absolutely right. And I'm going to speak to that. Because a large part of the reason why women are doing this, African-American women are doing this, is because they see that this is what men gravitate towards. But if men gravitate towards that because they have bought into these you know, European standards of beauty, then you have to let them go. You don't follow them down that road. You don't say, well, if that's what men are going for, then I'm going to go change my entire look so I can you know, be a part of the in crowd. La wallahi. La wallahi, not Muslims. I, I don't, if, if you are of, of another religion, another faith, I can't speak for, I'm speaking on behalf of what we have in our religion. In our religion. You understand? So the superficiality, and, and the thing about it being haram is not just because it, 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 it's a superficial, you know, standard of beauty. But that superficiality, you know, that look outlook on what beauty is, as superficial as it is, it begins to affect your personality. Don't think one has nothing to do with the other. A woman who put fake hair in her hair, fake eyelashes, shaves her eyebrows, has fake nails on, right? That the fakeness of all of that begins to affect the sincerity of her character. There's, there's no way that you can make me believe that everything about this woman is fake. Your Gucci bag is fake. Your red bottom shoes is fake. Your hair is fake. Your eyelashes is fake. Your nails are fake. Your breasts might be fake. And your character is real? I'm not buying that. Not humanly possible. And your character is real? Your personality is real, authentic, sincere? Not going to happen. Because those things begin to affect your personality. Those things begin to affect your personality, your character. You understand? When you begin to adopt these things, that, that becomes a lifestyle for you. 
You got to get up in the morning and put your eyelashes on. You got to get up and put the fake nails on. You got to get up and fix your tracks and fix your weave, your bundles. Your Everything about you is fake. You don't think that that's going to have some type of impact on your personality? It affects every single aspect of you because it's a mentality. It's a mentality. I'm not talking about wearing makeup and you might be an exception to the rule. You wear makeup and you not fake. But here again, that's subjective because that's you talking about yourself. Let's see what other people have to say about you. It's not about how you how you dictate that to yourself. It's not you don't get to dictate whether you're real or not. The people around you dictate to you whether you're real or not. How, who says I wear makeup but I'm not fake? Okay, that's that's your <laughs> that's your philosophy about yourself. What does others have to say about? What do others have to say about you? You don't you don't decide that. You allow other people other people do that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Antum shuhada Allahi fil ard. You all are the witnesses of God in the earth. <laughs> the people will tell your story. The people will say, you know, after your demise, the people will say, oh, this person was this or this person was that. The people will speak. People will judge that. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you all are the witnesses of God on the earth. Meaning what the majority has to say about a person, you know what I mean? And what people say about the person is usually what it is. Not necessarily what the person says about themselves. You can say anything you want to say about yourself. All right. So let me, sh let me give you the delil for that. I made a comment and now I want to back that up. I made a comment. I want to back that up. The superficiality of your outlook on beauty begins to affect the genuineness of your character. On the authority of Asma, sisters, pay attention to this hadith. On the authority of Asma, the sister of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha call it, and the imra'atan call it, Ya Rasulullah, inna li durra, fa hala alayya janah, in shaba'atu, ya'ni adhartu min zawji ghayr alladhi yu'atini. Fa qala nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, المتشبع بما لم يعطى كلابس الثوبي الزور رواه بخاري. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم اسمه. Sisters, pay attention to this. What was my comment? My comment was, my my comment was the superficiality of your outlook on beauty begins to affect the genuineness of your personality and your character. Pay attention to this hadith. Asma. She said that a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, a woman came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, she said, O Messenger of Allah, I have a co-wife, meaning I am in a polygynous marriage. I'm in a polygynous situation where my husband has another wife. Annali Durra. I have a co-wife. She said, Fahal alayya junah, is there any sin on me? In tashabbatu min zawji ghayr alladhi yu'atini. I have a co-wife, right? This is a polygynous situation. She said, would it be any sin on me if I outwardly displayed to my co-wife that my husband gave me something that he actually didn't give me? Would there be any sin on me? What do you notice from that? <laughs> the superficiality. She's trying to make herself look more than what she really is, right? She's, this is exactly what you guys are doing with these false standards of beauty. With the fake eyelashes, the fake hair, the fake boobs, the fake behind, all of that stuff. You understand? You're trying to make the world believe something about you that is not realistic. It's not real. No different than what this woman is asking the Prophet ﷺ. She said, I have a co-wife. Would it be any sin on me if I displayed to her that my husband gave me things that he didn't give me to make myself look like I'm more beloved to him than she is? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He said, Al-Mutashabbi' bima lam yu'ta he said, the person who outwardly displays that he is something that he is not is like a person who wears first or the, who wears two garments of um, 
Who wears, let me block this person. Who wears two garments of falsehood? Who wears two garments of falsehood? Meaning, understand the cultural reference here. Meaning, that during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, if a person wanted to display that he was an ascetic, that he was a religious person, he would wear a certain type of clothing. Right? So the Prophet, using this reference that you are wearing two garments of falsehood, meaning that you are dressing like you are an ascetic, but in fact, your heart is not of, your, the heart is of the world. Your clothes and your dress look like you are not of the world, but your heart is actually of the world. You are two-faced it in reality. <laughs> You're two-faced it. This is, this is the woman, right? Why? Because our religion encourages us to be organically, organically authentic. Not just authentic, because a lot of people like to think I'm, or, I'm, I'm authentic. But are you organic? No additions, no, you know, subtractions, additions that are unnecessarily not a part of who you really are. You understand? The Prophet ﷺ said that the person who tries to display to other people that they are more than what they are, then they are equivalent to a person that is wearing two garments of falsehood. Meaning you are displaying one side when in reality you are something else. When you take your tracks out, when you take your fake eyelashes off, when you take your fake nails off, right? No, cool has nothing to do with it. Cool is from the sunnah. That has nothing to do with it. That has nothing to do with it. We're talking about clear cut things that Islam has made haram. And you have Muslim women right now that are listening that got weave in their hair. And you're saying there, you're saying to yourself, I don't care what he's saying, I'm still gonna wear the weave. Okay, cool. But understand how that affects your personality and it affects the type of men that you attract. And it affects the type of men that you attract. Because any man who's cool with laying down with a woman who you know, has hair that's not her hair, that says a lot about him and his personality. Because he's now bought into the European standards of beauty, and now you fit you fit the profile, so he takes you. He don't take you because you're really organically beautiful. He takes you because his standards of beauty have been skewed, and you just so happen to fit the damn profile. So he takes you and lays down with you, not because he believes that you are beautiful, but because you meet the European standards of beauty, and he has bought into that. So he accepts you. You understand? So your whole relationship ain't organic. Your whole relationship, your whole connection. And I mean, the, the fact of the matter, you might, you might believe that what you have is love. I'm speaking from a religious standpoint. <laughs> I'm speaking from a religious standpoint. So you can sit here and say all day long, well, you know, I got weave and my husband loved me. Okay, but let's get down to the bottom of that love. Let's get down to the bottom of that. Because if he really, really loved you, then he would ask you to remove those things. Did you guys ever see the movie Beyond the Lights? The movie Beyond the Lights, which really didn't get a lot of airplay, but it speaks directly to what I'm saying right now. You understand? When the, the, the black dude who was the cop, right? When he, when he got involved with the woman, he started to show her that he was in love with the, the real person with who she was. And she no longer felt the need to wear the fake hair, the lashes, the nails. She began to take it off because he saw her, right? He saw her for who she was. She didn't need to feel like she needed to you know, live up to those standards no more because she was in a relationship with a man who loved her for who she was, minus all of the additions, minus all of that other superficial stuff. You understand? He loved her without the weave. He loved her without the fake eyelashes. Loved her without the fake nails. So if you're in a relationship with a man and he lets you wear a weave, he tell you you look beautiful with a weave on, he's a lie. Or he's telling you the truth, but you're living a lie because it ain't real beauty. It ain't real beauty. Facts. 
Either he's living a lie or he's standing in his own super, uh, superficial truth and you're living the lie. Because if he's a real man, there's no way in the world he would let you lay down with him with a weave in your head telling you that you're beautiful because he hasn't really seen you, the real beauty of you. He hasn't really seen the real beauty of you. If you take your tracks out, take your bundles out, take everything off and ask him, am I beautiful? And if he says yes, then you don't need to put it back in. You understand? So the Prophet Wasallam told the woman, you know, to, to display, to make yourself look like you're more than what you really are. Then you are equivalent to a person who, who wears two garments of falsehood. You're not real. You're displaying one thing, but deep down inside, you're something completely different. And this is why our religion has made these things haram. Because you are supposed to be authentic, authentic, organically authentic. He fell in love with her before she took it out, but he wasn't concerned with all of that, which is why she felt comfortable taking it out. He wasn't. He actually called her on the, the superficial stuff, which made her uncomfortable being in that space with him, you know, dressed like that. It made her uncomfortable. Because she was dealing with a guy who was authentic. So the disingenuousness of her character or her desire to pursue, you know, this, you know, being the better wife is directly connected to the insincerity of her personality and her character. If a man is in a, in a relationship now, mind you, in a polygynous situation, every woman is going to try to, you know, make themselves look like they are that that's normal jealousy stuff. But when you start going above and beyond you know, to make yourself seem like you are the more beloved wife. It's not just about the superficiality of what you're doing. It's about the disingenuousness of your personality and your character. Because that's who you are. The insincerity of your character. That is who you are. Call the Iyal, one of the great scholars of Islam. He commented on this hadith. Listen to what he said. He said, "Man da'a da'wa kadiba liyatakathara biha lam yazidhu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illa qilla." Call the Iyab. He said that no one claims to be something that they are not to make themselves look better in the eyes of the people except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them look less in the eyes of the people. Facts. And this speaks to the fact that the more the woman tries to make themselves look, you know, more than what and who they really are, the less desirable they become in the eyes of others. So sometimes you got to think like I'm putting all this weave, I'm doing all of this stuff, putting all this extra stuff. Look at the type of dudes that you attract when you do that. You're not attracting somebody who is genuine, someone who is sincere and organic. Who understands what real beauty is. And if you're a Muslim man and your wife wears weaves, I don't even know how you live with that. I, I really don't know how you, other than, I mean, like, I don't want to call you a cuckold, but I mean, how do you live with a woman who wears weaves? And it's something that has been cursed. It is a major sin. A major sin. It's not like backbiting or something small, you know, lowering your gaze. We're talking about something that you will be cursed for. You are cursed for doing this. And you you wake up every morning to a woman who puts a wig on, who puts a weave in her hair. Who puts fake fingernails on, who put fake eyelashes on. And you, st you still live with this woman in the capacity of husband and wife. How you do that? The Prophet Sallallahu cursed the woman who trims her eyebrows and it doesn't matter how you trim it. Some of you think because you go to the mall and you get the woman to do it with the string, it's not that bad. Some of you pluck it yourself. Oh, these, you know, loose eyelashes or these loose, you know, hairs up here. You pluck it yourself. The Prophet Sallallahu said any woman who plucks her eyebrows is cursed. Any woman who gaps her teeth out of beauty is cursed. 
any woman who uh, gets tattooed, the person who gets the tattoo and the person who tattoos, color contacts, hold on as well. Because you're trying to make your eye look like it's a color other than what it really is. Absolutely. The ruling still follows. You're still trying to display. What do you understand from being organic? <laughs> I mean, hair in the, in the middle of your eyebrow, you have a unibrow. Yeah, no, there's no sin on you to shave that. You have hair growing down here. Sometimes, you know, your uh, eye, you know, minds even grow sometimes and it, in effect, you know, goes into my eye. I mean, that's different. You're not doing it for beauty purposes. We're talking about doing it for the purpose of enhancing your beauty. So, you know, we have to understand, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to drive home the point, man. Like, sisters have gone, have gone way overboard with this whole idea of the, the, the beauty, you know, and the adding, you know, you're wearing fake eyelashes and you're trimming your, 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 your eyebrows and you got fake nails on and all of this other stuff. And then you advertising this stuff like it's okay. And then the young girls, they see that and they see their mom wearing weave. They see their mom wearing a the wig. They see like their daughter, you are feeding your daughter a false standard of beauty. So not only are you sinful in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for doing this, but now you get the sin of spreading that. Because what society is doing, what these product manufacturers are doing are using you as the advertisement. You are now advertising, right? You're advertising for the fake eyelashes because when you put them in and you take a picture of yourself and you post it on Instagram, then now other people want to go do it. This is the danger of Instagram because people see these pictures or Snapchat. People see these pictures and then they want to go do it because they saw you doing it. They saw you doing it. Every third picture of a Muslim woman on Instagram is some sinful picture of you in, you know, heavy makeup, your eyebrows is arched, your fake eyelashes and is loud and lipstick. I, I mean, like, OK, we see you. We get we get it. We see you. But I mean, like that, that doesn't enhance your beauty. That doesn't en those things don't enhance your beauty. Surely not in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surely not in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't enhance your beauty. And I know you're going to have a whole bunch of sisters who want to say, I'm wrong, I'm hating on women, whatever the case may be. No, I'm not hating on you. Do you. This is for those who have a heart and still conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and want to take heed. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, indeed, this is a reminder for those who have a heart. You have a heart. And who will lend an ear and bears witness to the truth. That's what I'm speaking to. So if what I'm saying is doesn't, you know, doesn't sit well with you and I'm wrong and blah, 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 you can believe whatever you want to believe. I have a responsibility in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil. If that doesn't sit right with you, then I'm sorry. But enjoying what is good and forbid and what's evil is going to be part of our religion until Yom al This 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 aspect of our deen is not going anywhere. This aspect of our religion is not going to go to where it could be me today. It'll be somebody else tomorrow. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire some loud mouth imam student of knowledge tomorrow that will come and say the same exact thing that I'm saying. It, it had nothing to do with me. I'm just upholding my part of the bargain. I took my shahada and this was part of the deal to enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to give you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give uh, shahada. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to give shahada. And he used to give shahada under certain conditions. That you would not fornicate. You would not commit zina. You would not kill your children out of fear of poverty. And that you will enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil. This was part of my deal. 
But Qadi Iyad, he said, من ادعى دعوة كاذبة ليتكثر بها لم يزده الله إلا قلة. The Prophet called the Iyad, he said, whoever claims to be something that he is not, lying to make himself look like he is more than what he is in the sight of the people, Allah will only make him look less in the sight of the people. And this speaks, this speaks to the fact that the more a person or a woman, more a person or a woman tries to make themselves look more than what they are, then they uh, then they actually look less desirable than what they really are, and this could apply as called the Iyal continue. He said, "This is um, this is general, and it applies to a person who tries to make themselves look like they got more money than other people. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will actually make you look like you have less than other people, right? You have so many people walking around with fake Gucci, fake Fendi, fake Louis Vuitton, fake this, fake that, trying to make yourself look like something that you're not." You're, you're trying to make yourself look like something that you are not. Meanwhile, you got black entrepreneurs, African-American entrepreneurs that are selling their merchandise, selling their clothing, material, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, we won't spend a dime with them, but you'll go spend your money with Louis, you know, Fendi. They don't put nothing back into your community. Support black entrepreneurs. Facts. Support black entrepreneurs. Support black businesses. It's a damn shame that we are the only culture in the world that has to say that to each other. You don't hear Asians saying support Asian businesses. <laughs> you, you don't hear, you know, Caucasians saying support Caucasian businesses. African Americans, this is how jacked we are as a people. We got to tell, remind each other to support black businesses. <laughs> because soon as we get paid, our money leaves our community and goes somewhere else. The, in the moment we get paid. We go to the Spanish guy down the street to go get our car wash. Give him $20, $30 to detail the car. Right? We take another hundred dollars and go to champs and go here, go there, whatever the case may be. Go buy some sneakers, go buy this. Like, and by the time your paycheck is gone, eighty percent of your entire paycheck has left your community. <laughs> eighty percent of your check is gone and has left your community. I mean, this is real talk. We're the only race of people that we have to say support black businesses. And, and, and another thing with the support black businesses for, for you Muslims, stop using Islam to sell your products. If your product is not authentic, you think we can slap halal on something and, you know, it's a go. <laughs> Muslims, stop being enticed by the word halal. And for you Muslims that have your own businesses, man, conduct yourselves professionally. Conduct yourselves with integrity. Conduct yourselves with integrity. Wallah, we should be ashamed. Yeah, I have it on Adidas shirt. I mean, that doesn't mean I bought it from an Adidas store. You don't know what? I could have been downtown somewhere. I could have been in a black neighborhood somewhere. I could have bought this from anywhere. Don't try to call. Don't come for me. Don't come for me. <laughs> don't come for me. You don't know where I bought this from. <laughs> I could have bought this from downtown Newark somewhere. I, I could have down. I could have bought this from downtown Wilmington somewhere, like from a black store. You understand what I'm saying? Like, don't look at the logo. Look at where my money was spent. You understand? Don't come for me, man. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's 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 important that you know we support black businesses. That's important. That's important. The product may not be as you know as. Grandiose as all of the other products that we that, that we you know that we've been sold on, you know what I mean. But at the same token, it's the support that that matters. It's the support that matters. You find a black business, somebody doing something, man. Even if you don't necessarily want the product, help them out. All right, so you know it it, it also applies to people who try to make like they got more money than other people. Right. It also applies to make people who try to make themselves look like they're more knowledgeable than people. Right. Let me just block this guy. He's been a 
thorn in our side since we begin the discussion. Um, seamstresses, like you guys selling overgarments and stuff. And this is not really my place. You know what I mean? I'm the sister. Uh, I believe Sister Aziza kind of got on and, and you know kind of gave the business about that so I, I that's not really my place man but if you you selling overgarments you sell you seamstresses you selling overgarments and stuff like that man have some integrity in how you do business stop using islam stop taking advantage of muslims because we're muslim and you can just sell your product you know muslims we're automatic consumers to a muslim business owner because you're muslim so we take advantage of that you know what i mean we we take advantage of that. The fact that I'm Muslim, so I automatically now have clientele amongst the Muslim community because I'm a Muslim by default. So I automatically have clientele. But you also have to deal with integrity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, La ta'kulu amwalakum bainakum bil batil. Do not eat up your wealth amongst yourselves in falsehood, man. Stop taking people's money unjustly, man. Selling them garments that are ripping at the seams. You get the garment. You ordering garments from people. They don't even respond to you. They don't give you your money back. You know what I mean? You've been waiting for garments for, you know, three, four weeks and you still haven't received your money. You still haven't received your product. The person doesn't respond to your emails anymore. Like, yo, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell over a hundred dollars. You're going to go to, you're going to go to the hellfire for $80 for overgrown. You really needed $80. Why didn't you just do a GoFundMe page and ask for $80? Why are you doing it under the guise of selling overgarments? You didn't have to do that. The Muslims are very generous. Muslims are very generous people if you didn't know that. All you had to do was do a GoFundMe page. I need $80 to go, you know, pay a phone bill and then use the rest to go get high. I mean, you do you. Because what you doing with eighty dollars? What you doing with two hundred dollars? Like, I mean, come on, we're adults. What, what, what can you possibly do with two hundred dollars? Cell phone bills is more than two hundred dollars. Like, I mean, like, what are you doing with two hundred dollars? If you just needed two hundred dollars, why didn't you just open up a GoFundMe page and mus let Muslims donate to you? Muslims are very generous, especially now, the first ten days of the Hijjah. Muslims are very generous. <laughs> But you do it under the guise of selling overgarments, and then the person pays you, never receive their product, never get their money back, you never respond to their email, you're going to go to hell for $200? That is some real crackhead stuff. Stop using drugs, man. Because that's, that's stuff that people who get high do. Stop using drugs and then using the Islamic community when it's convenient for you. It's convenient for you, so you abuse the Muslim community because you can, because you're a Muslim. Sick, man. It's, it's really sad, man. So if you're a Muslim owner, you know, business owner, man, subhanAllah, have some integrity, man. Have honor in what you do and how you handle yourself, man. Your reputation precedes you. Your reputation is everything, man. That's how you sell your product. I, I was late or whatever. Anybody know that if I, I was late or whatever the case may be, I'll send you the book for free. I'll give you the money. I'll give you your money back. I don't care about your $22. Ain't nobody trying to take your $22. I'll give you the book for free. My my bad. My I you know, I mismanaged you know the way your your product was sent to you or whatever the case may be, and I'm gonna give it to you for free. And then you're going to go and say to somebody else, you know, I bought a book from Imam Shadid and it took this long to get it. And mashallah, he gave me my money back. That That's your reputation. That's your reputation preceding you. Uh, it's, it's really important, man, that, you know, we conduct ourselves with integrity. But even as it relates to our character, you know, we should be it should be rooted in sincerity. This is something that, you know, I'm about to end here. This is something that we've lost sight of today. That our personalities, our characters are not even sincere. We are so fluffy. You know what I mean? It's just all fluff. All fluff. Even as it relates to our character, it should be rooted in sincerity. The Prophet ﷺ said, لَا يَدْخُلُ جَنَّ ذُو وَجْهَيْنِ فَقَالُوا مَنْ ذُو وَجْهَيْنِ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ the Prophet Sallallahu said that the person who has two faces will not enter into paradise. We're talking about integrity. We're talking about sincerity of character now. We're talking about sincerity of character. 
and how that is important. And when you are sincere in your character, you can't possibly fathom accepting, you know, you know, disingenuous disingenuousness in, in terms of how you, you know, look physically. Because that's part of who you are. When you are sincere here in the heart, everything else about you is sincere. When you're beautiful here internally, everything about you is organically beautiful. You don't feel the need to have, you know, these superficial, you know, elements added or subtracted from your body to make you look beautiful. That has a lot to do with your personality. That has a lot to do with your mindset. It's not just when a, a woman puts weave in her hair or puts fake lashes on or does this fake or does that fake. That is speaking to a deeper issue. That's speaking to a deeper issue of insincerity. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, The person who has two faces will not enter into paradise. And the Sahaba asked him, Well, who, who is the one who has two faces? And listen to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, He is the type of person that goes to, one, to, to, goes to this group of people with one face and this group of people with another face. This is the two-faced person that will not enter into paradise. Brother, why don't you talk about Muslim women who are covering their hair, not wearing hijab, who are not covering their hair? Because not covering your hair, not wearing hijab, that's a personal issue. That, that's a personal issue. I don't know why a woman would not wear hijab. You got to get into the why of that. I'm not getting into that. Muslim women who struggle with the hijab should not be shamed and beat up in a lecture. That's, that's a personal issue, a personal journey of spirituality that they are struggling with. And, and we've, we've heard enough. Haven't, hasn't there been enough lectures beating up on sisters by not wearing hijab? And, and it's, really, it's really sad because we miss the, we miss the issue. We, we actually miss the point because a woman not wearing hijab doesn't mean that she's not God-fearing. A woman who puts weave in her hair is a clear indication that she is not God-fearing. A woman not wearing hijab is not a, is not a major sin. <laughs> There's no text, textual evidence in the Quran or in the Sunnah that states that a woman who does not wear the hijab is a major sinner and is going to hellfire for that. Give me one, please. Give me one. I'll wait for it all day. You got my email, Imam Shadid Muhammad at Gmail. Give me one text. Give me one text that says the woman that doesn't wear the hijab is a major sinner. And I can give you loads of texts that a woman who puts fake hair in her hair is cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she's a major sinner. I can give you three hadith off the top of my head right now. You understand? Sisters have been beat up enough about not wearing hijab. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with the fact that she's not spiritual, she's not religious, or she's not God-fearing. It has everything to do with her own personal journey that has, that has nothing to do with this. So I'm not going to beat women up about not wearing hijab, man. Like, no, it's, it's enough men beating up on women by not wearing hijab out there. That's not the issue. That's not the issue here. The issue here is fake hair, fake nails, fake weave, fake wigs, we're, fake eyelashes. That's what we're talking about here today. And all of these things are major sin. Major sin. Kabair. Kabair, major sin. We're not talking about, you know, some minor infraction that you just say astaghfirullah and Allah will forgive you for. We're talking about major sin that even if you spent the rest of your life making toba for, it's still no guarantee that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive you and you're going to have to answer to that. You're going to have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. And why a woman doesn't wear hijab? There's a plethora of reasons why women don't wear hijab. Or half cover their hair. There, you got to get to the, the the root of that. And I don't have the ability to do that. I don't know why every sister who don't wear hijab don't wear hijab. And if you talk to 10 different women who don't wear hijab, you'll get 10 different stories for why. You understand? You'll get 10 different stories for why. So there's no one size fits all, you know, method of handling not wearing the hijab. You, know, you, you guys follow me. So we, we have to be more sensitive when it comes to that. That's, that's not my issue. That's not my issue. So 
the Prophet Sallallahu said that the person who has two faces will not enter into paradise. The Sahaba said, well, who is the one who has two faces? He said, the one who goes to this group of people with one face and goes to this group of people, right? Yes, uh, I'm not saying that it's not okay. I'm not saying that it is okay not to wear hijab. But what I am saying is for the sisters who don't wear hijab, they have a why. Everybody has a different why for why they don't wear the hijab. You understand? And that can't possibly, and it's not just, oh, they don't fear Allah. Like, that's an easy way to chalk it up to say, oh, she don't fear Allah. That's 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 not why. You have some sisters who put on the hijab when they pray. You understand? I, I can't I can't decipher that. I don't know why ten different sisters who don't wear hijab, why they don't wear hijab. I don't know why. And and I, it's not me giving a lecture about wearing the hijab and the Quranic ayats and hadith about it or whatever the case may be, it's not gonna make them put the hijab on if their issue is not rooted in text. You understand? If it's if it's not rooted in text, she's not wearing a hijab because she don't she 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 believes that it's not wajib. I mean, she knows that covering her hair is wajib. But there might be some other issues, some other circumstances that I don't know. You right? And we don't want to push people further away. Let people find their own way in their journey to spirituality. Their journey that hijab that is a journey. It was 18 years that went by since the Prophet ﷺ first received revelation until the re revelation of the hijab. 18 years. That means that the Sahabiyat had 18 years with no pressure on them to cover their hair. You understand? Or to cover their bodies. 18 years. No pressure. And then Allah reveals the ayat of hijab. You understand? We women take shahada today and tomorrow she's under intense pressure to cover her hair and wear her hijab and, and and it totally dismisses it overlooks all of the other outlining issues or other issues in her life that are more important to her. You understand? When a woman takes shahada, putting on the hijab is not her top priority for the most part, although it is for us. It's, it's, it's a top priority from us because we're sitting from a place of privilege. But for a woman who converts to Islam, she might have, you know, an, uh, an uh, un, you know, cooperative co-parent. You know, she might be living with her parents who are Christians. You know, she might be homeless after she, you know, that are, you know, of top priority to her. So I'm not going into that. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is, you know, speaking to an issue of people who wear two faces. You know, you, you present one face to this group of people and you present another face to another group of people. And this type of person who finds difficulty in being authentic with themselves, they can't possibly be authentic with other people. If you are, if you can't be, you can't find it in yourself to be authentic and genuine and organic with yourself, you can't possibly be organic with anybody else or genuine with anybody else. So this is why the prophet said that he goes to this group of people with one face and this group of people. You can't even be authentic with yourself. An example of this are, you know, sisters, and I'm going to end here, but I just want to give sisters something to think about for, you know, you guys that want to be beautiful. All right. If you're going to be beautiful, then be beautiful all around the board. Don't just be beautiful in one particular area in your life. Be beautiful. If you're going to be beautiful, then let beauty radiate your entire presence. Don't just be beautiful in one area of your life. Your face is pretty. That's it. <laughs> she got a pretty face. Don't just be another pretty face. Let everything about you be pretty. Let everything about you be beautiful. Don't just be beautiful in one area of your life. But an example of this is sisters who spend so much time beautifying themselves outwardly with makeup and tight fitting dresses because they're not overgarments. What you guys are wearing today is not overgarments. Please stop saying they're overgarments. If you got your top breasts showing, everybody can see everything, right? This spandex material that you are now substituting for an overgarment is not an overgarment. Stop calling it an overgarment. Here again, misrepresenting Islam. You understand? This is it's not an overgarment. Stop calling it an overgarment. Because it's not. 
But you have sisters who wear, you know, this tight material, almost like spandex. You've turned spandex into a garment. It's not an overgarment. It's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to wear in the Quran. Right? But you spend so much time beautifying yourself outwardly with makeup and tight fitting dresses. But your characters are not aligned with the superficiality. But your characters are aligned with the superficiality of it all rather than what is encouraged Islamically. Right? The char your character doesn't reflect your beauty. You know what I mean? The circle of people that you hang with don't reflect your beauty. Your eating habits don't reflect your beauty. Your house doesn't help reflect your beauty. So if you're going to be beautiful, then be beautiful all around the board. Don't just be beautiful in the face. Be beautiful with the type of friends that you carry around, the, the type of friends that you surround yourself with. Don't be beautiful with just your face and makeup and, you know, your overgarment. Be beautiful in your relationship with God. In your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't just be beautiful in your face and in your overgarment. Be beautiful in the way that you have your house. Don't be outside looking all beautiful and glamorous. And then we step foot in your house and your house is filthy. Your kitchen is filthy. You still got dishes in your sink from two days ago. Yet you out and about with makeup on and tight overgarments on. Come on, knock it off, man. If you're going to be beautiful, be beautiful all around the board. Facts, tell me. I, I know, tell me. If you're going to be beautiful, be beautiful all around the board. Don't be outside with makeup on and tight overgarments on, doing it for the gram, and your kitchen is filthy. You got roaches running around your damn kitchen. Be beautiful all around the board. Be beautiful all around the board. Don't be beautiful in the face, right? Beautiful in the face, and your and your overgarment is nice, mashallah, but your eating habits is, is filthy, your eating habits are filthy. You still eat from Popeye's. You still eat from McDonald's. You still eat from places that serve you food that's not a, that's the genetically modified. How are you beautiful? Be beautiful all around the board. Let your beauty be organic. Let your cleaning be organic. Let your eating habits be organic. Let everything about you be organic. Everything. Let everything be beautiful. Right? Don't just be beautiful in one area of your life, sisters. Be beautiful all around the board. Trifling. Be beautiful. If you're going to be beautiful, be beautiful all around the board. Don't, pretend, don't, don't select one area of your life where it is easy for you to be beautiful and then leave everything else. The Prophet wasallam said, Inna Allah ketab al-ihsan ala kulli shay. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has obligated, has prescribed perfection in everything that we do. Everything, let everything that you do be beautiful. Everything. Let your character be beautiful. Let your friends be beautiful. The people that you surround yourself with, let them be beautiful. Let your eating habits be beautiful. Everything. Don't just select one particular area of your life and make that beautiful and everything else in your life is ratchet. In ending, Ibn al-Qayyim, pay attention to this. We're talking about let everything be beautiful. Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, وَجَمَالْ سَائِلُ هَذِهِ الْأَكْوَانِ مِنْ بَعْضِ آثَارِ الْجَمِيلِ فَرَبُّهَا أَوْلَى وَأَجْدَرُ عِنْدَ ذِي الْإِرْفَانِ In a line of poetry, line of poetry, and I'm going to end here. Ibn Qayyim, he said, وَجَمَالْ سَائِلُ هَذِهِ الْأَكْوَانِ The beauty that you see in the world around you, مِنْ آثَارِ الْجَمِيلِ is from the traces of the beauty of Al-Jamil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beautiful. So the Lord of the beauty, the splendor that you see around you is more deserving of the awe that you are inspired to have when you see it. You understand? The beauty of the world that is around you is just traces of the real beauty where it comes from. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is beautiful and he placed beauty in everything that he did. You understand? So if you're going to be beautiful, then let your beauty radiate in everything that you did. 
Ibn Qayyim said, وَجَمَالْ سَائِلُ هَذِهِ الْأَكْوَانِ And the beauty and splendor of the world that you see in front of you, مِنْ بَعْدِ آثَالِ الْجَمِيلِ is from the traces of the beauty of Al-Jameel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beautiful. فَرَبُّهَا أَوْلَى وَأَجْدَرُ وَعِنْدَ ذِي الْإِرْفَانِ And so the Lord of this great splendor world that you are so amazed with, He is more deserving of the amazement and the awe that you are inspired to have when you look at His creation. When you look at Allah's creation, you see how beautiful it is? It's only pointing you to the beauty of the one who created it. Understand? So if you're going to be beautiful, sister, then let everything about you be beautiful. Let somebody walk into your home and see how beautiful your house is. Even though your garment may not be tight, your, your lipstick might not be popping, your earrings might not be this or that, but you walk into her home, her home is beautiful, clean. It speaks volumes to the beauty that is deep inside that woman. You understand? When you go and you meet her friends, and you see how beautiful her friends are and how they carry themselves. It speaks volumes to the emphasis that she places on the people that she keeps around her. When you look at her relationship with God, her relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very few sins, no major sins, pray on time, pray, you know, on, on, on a consistent basis. You understand? That speaks, that speaks volumes to the beauty of her. You understand? Even though she might not be beautiful physically. You know what I mean? But everything else. Her beauty radiates in everything else that she does. And I pray that you know you sisters you get this. And I pray that as brothers that we are listening. Because this lecture was for the brothers. For you brothers to understand what real beauty is. Understand what real beauty is. And stop chasing this ghost. This ghost, this long hair, light skin, long eyelashes, big behind, big breasts, porn, half porn star, half, you know, you know, independent woman got it all like this. This is the, the mentality that has been, you know, superimposed on us. And this is what we go after. And when we can't find her in the Islamic community, we'll go out to the non-Muslim and we'll go find. But we're going to find her. It's almost like a drug. Like this image has been placed into our minds and we can't shake it. And we're going to go find that image, whether in the Muslim community or whether in the non-Muslim community. We're going to find that image. And it's you chasing a ghost. It's not real. It's not real. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all for our shortcomings. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salama tasliman kithira wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. You guys should be having conversations right now. This was about conversations. I'm trying to spark conversations. So if you have children, you have daughters more specifically, right? Then you need to be having conversations with them now at this point. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.